How about we stand together? I want you to grab your Bibles as we pray together this morning. I believe that we gather because God has a word for us, and we have to be good hearers and doers of his word. Can you say amen? And so I believe that the preacher preaches as well as the people are willing to receive the word. So are you ready to receive what God has for us this morning? You know, I want to give a shout out to people listening to all over the world. Listen, I want to show you, this is some of the countries that people are tuning in from. I want to give them a shout out real quick. Shout out to Thailand, uh, Portugal, United Kingdom, Nigeria, India, Palestine, Indonesia, Canada, k Verde, my favorite, Puerto Rico, Philippines, Brazil. So awesome what God is doing. It's amazing that God can take something and just blow it up this way. Again, don't waste your crisis because God's not wasting it. Amen. So get your Bibles. Let's pray together. Father, thank you that we get together and it's cool that we have friends all over the world tuning into your word this morning. I thank you, Lord, for the privilege that we have to be in your house. We believe that every Sunday is a new beginning. So come, Holy Spirit, and teach us your word. God, open our hearts and our minds so that we don't just hear the word, but we are doers of the word. I pray that our hearts are open, our minds are receptive, and that we are going to produce fruit in Jesus' name. So have your way with every one of us, we pray. And we all said, amen, amen, amen. amen. High five, five people if you can, if you're able. And, 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 uh, and you can have a seat this morning. Building a solid life after the honeymoon. Our Bible reading is going to come from Matthew chapter 7. Matthew 7 is part of a long sermon that Jesus did known as the Sermon on the Mount. It starts actually in Matthew chapter 5. If you want to go home and get the fullness of his message, you got to go home and read Matthew 5, 6, and then 7. What we're going to read right now is actually the conclusion of Jesus' message titled Sermon on the Mount. And this is how he concludes this amazing message, one of the most popular messages of Jesus that everybody knows in, in, all over the world. Uh, here's what Jesus says. He says, anyone who listens to my teaching and follows it is wise, like a person who builds a house on solid rock. Though the rain comes in torrents and the floodwaters rise and the winds beat against that house, it won't collapse because It is built on bedrock. But anyone who hears my teaching and doesn't obey, it is foolish. Like a person who built a house on sand. When the rain and floods come and the winds beat against that house, it will collapse with a mighty crash. Can you say amen? So my friends, the goal is to build a solid life. A life that goes the distance, can you say amen? We know that life is filled with honeymoon moments and seasons, right? Right now is the season of graduations. That's a honeymoon moment, right? When you graduate from high school, it's a really big deal. When you graduate from college or from nursing school, it's an amazing accomplishment. It's an amazing moment in your life. It's a landmark in your life, right? But the reality hits about two or three weeks later that now I got to get a job. (laughs) Right? Like the high doesn't stay that long when you realize I got all these loans now. And what a way to start life with all these student loans. They say, go be great. Go get in debt. Right? But that doesn't hit until about six months when they, like, start calling you that you're behind on your loans. And some of y'all are quiet because you're right there <laughs> in that moment. But their life is filled with honeymoon moments. What about when you get a new house? The excitement of a new house. There's nothing like it. There's nothing like signing your life away. Three hours of signing. Uh, but you sign, you don't even know what you're signing. You're just signing away. But you're just excited. You're getting these keys and you're going to go to your house and, it's, and you, you have your own bedroom. You have your own grass. <laughs> right? And it's, it's exciting to, to be on a homeowner, but then, but then reality hits. Now I have a mortgage. 
Now I want to have a mortgage. Now I need to become a plumber. <laughs> and I need to start a landscaping business. Because this grass is not going to cut itself. <laughs> right? There's, there's these honeymoon moments, but they just don't last. Right? How about when you buy a new car? There's nothing like the smell of a new car. There's just nothing like a smell of a new car. And you make this vow to yourself. I am going to clean this car every single weekend. This car is going to be impeccable. No one will eat in this car. You make those rules. But then, you know, you break those rules yourself a few weeks later when you're late for work and you got your Dunkin' Donuts and you're eating, you spill the coffee, you ah! And months later, your car looks like a dumpster. Your guff compartment looks like a snack box. Why? Because there's something about the honeymoon. And then reality comes calling. How about a new job? There's nothing like the excitement of a new job, especially if it comes with a promotion. Especially if it's like, man, I'm getting a raise with this new job. But then a few months later, that same job you prayed for. <laughs> oh, it's the job you begin to complain about. Right? It's the job that makes you wish you were back in Egypt. <laughs> it's amazing how honeymoons are awesome, but they just don't last. How about a new relationship? There's nothing like, no, you hang up. No, 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 you hang up. Girl, you must be tired. Why? Because you've been running through my mind all day long. Oh, let a few months go by, a year go by. Now it's like, are you done? Because I got to go. Oh, why are you tired? You haven't done anything all day. Oh, there's nothing like honeymoons. But the problem is they don't last. They don't last. But what about when you get saved? Oh, there's nothing like getting saved. Oh, there's nothing like tasting Jesus for the first time. And, and you're excited. Oh, you can't wait to get to church and get your worship on and, and, and feel goosebumps. And this Wednesday night, my kids were here for the first, for, for, by the way, shout out to our kids ministry. I'm so thankful that we're back in the building. But my 12 year old came home and he said, dad, you know, when we were doing that song, I just felt something I never felt before. I felt like goosebumps all over me. I said, my son, those are the spirit bumps, man. That, those are awesome. You know, what's amazing is this though. It's like, they don't last. Right? And you start coming to church, you're like, what happened to the bombs? God must not be real anymore. I can't feel him anymore. Oh, when you find a new church and you tell everybody about, oh my gosh, this is that child new life cycle. It is amazing. <laughs> but then a few months goes by and they begin to tell you to tithe and to be obedient. Now all of a sudden, all of that feeling, all the emotions kind of begins to dry away. And you start to wonder, oh, maybe this is the right, not the right one. Maybe I need to find another one. Oh, honeymoons are awesome, but they don't last. The, the thing is, I believe God never intended us to live in honeymoon seasons. I think God intended to give us honeymoon seasons to propel us into better seasons, into better tomorrows. So my friends, my goal with this, se with this series is that we need to live beyond honeymoons. If we want to have life that will last for eternity, we need to build on solid foundation. You know, they say the key to every house is the cornerstone. The cornerstone is the first stone that you lay down when you're building something, and, it, and, it, and it's the focus of the entire house. It, it, it aligns everything else that you're going to do. You know, the Bible says in Ephesians chapter 2, 20, that Jesus is the cornerstone. Look, together we are his Come on, say it like you, like you mean it. We are his house built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, and the cornerstone is Christ Jesus himself. So before we go any further, my friends, I want to establish something here as we go into this series. I think we're going to go on a great journey ahead of us, but I want to make it clear that we have to first establish who is the cornerstone of our lives. My friends, we're not into self-help, we're into Jesus' help. We're, we're, we're into believing that Jesus is the cornerstone upon which I want to build everything else about my life. If I get Jesus wrong, I may get everything else wrong. So I pray we understand we're not here to just get a few nuggets for life. We're here to build upon the foundation that Jesus has established 
as the Lord and Savior of our lives. I hope we can stop there because I'm telling you, everything I'm going to share for the next few weeks will not make sense if Jesus is not first the cornerstone that you're building your life upon. He said, I am the cornerstone. He says, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. When Jesus is the cornerstone, come hell or high water, nothing can stop you from his will, from his purpose for your life. But first, he has to be the cornerstone of your life. Can you say amen? The Bible even tells you in Corinthians that everything that's not built upon Jesus will burn away. Did you know that? It says one day believers will be judged based on what we did if we were rooted in Jesus. It says everything we do will burn away if it's not built upon the cornerstone of Jesus Christ. Can you say amen? So that's the first thing we need to establish as Jesus says that building a solid life is like building a house. And for anyone who has gone house shopping, you know how challenging it is. How many of you guys have done house shopping? Like, you know the challenges of finding the ideal home. I remember the first time we went house shopping, we still lived in Rhode Island, and we wanted to buy a house. And we, I'm, I'm telling you, I don't know how many houses we looked at. I remember we finally came up across a house that we felt like, man, this is the ideal home. It fits the budget. Man, I can see the kids running around here. Man, because we know we need a lot of room for a lot of kids. And, and so I, I'm, I'm all excited. And Lindsay's excited. It's in North Providence. It's in a good location. And we got all excited. And so we said, the next key thing is we need to get someone here who knows about houses to tell us, like, is this going to be a good investment? So we call a friend of mine who was in construction and I said, man, we found this place and we, we're in love with it. We love it. Would you come and look at this place with us and tell us what you think? And he came and he began to look at that house, but he's not having the same excitement that I was having. I'm walking around with him. I'm seeing his face. I'm like, your face doesn't look like my face. And I'm thinking, oh, this is not going well. And so he did his thing. And when he was done, you know, he, he, he didn't want to, you know, he's, a, he's my friend. He doesn't want to crush my spirit. But he's like, man, I don't know. It's like, man, what do you mean, man? It's like, look, at, look at this place. Looks amazing. Kids. Yeah, look, man cave. <laughs> you know that's not true when you have kids. It's a toy cave. <laughs> hey, it's like you got to step over stuff to watch a game. <laughs> if I can step on one more Lego. And my son is driving me nuts with these Legos. Anyways. <laughs> he says, man, I, I, don't, I don't know. It's not, I don't think it's a good idea. I was like, man, why, why? He goes, because there's termites in the house. And if you don't know what termites is, Google it. Like Google the images. Like a termite will eat your house from the inside out. And he's like, man, listen, this is the worst investment you can make. As your friend, I got to tell you. And it crushed my spirit. And then not long after that, we really felt compelled to move here. And so we started the process all over again to try to buy a house in New Bedford and looked at so many houses. And once again, fell in love with this house. I fell in love with the potential of this house. And it fit the budget and it fit the criteria with the kids. And this time we asked an inspector from this place to come and look at it. And, and he's like, man, listen, I want to tell you straight up, I take my time when I'm doing my inspection because I want to make sure it's a good investment. So he comes and he spends. But by the way, we, we, we put a deposit on the house before we even inspected it. So he comes three, four hours later and he says, I don't think you should do it. Well, what do you mean? The place is amazing. Potential is there. He's like, man, here's the words he used. He said, this house does not have good bones to build upon. So here we are now crushed again, this time not just emotionally, but financially. My friends, I believe that if we're going to build a solid life, we first have to inspect the foundation. I think Jesus says this here. He said, listen, what are you building upon? It's critical. You're either going to build to last or it's going to come crashing down if you're not building upon the right foundation. So what I want to do today before we go any further with this series, is I want to help us 
identify some of the sandy foundations that we might have around our spiritual houses. Because if we can't identify those things, we're building on shifting sand. And sooner or later, the whole thing comes crashing down. Are you tracking with me so far? So allow me today, if you may, to be a spiritual house inspector. Because Jesus said your life is like a house and it needs to be built upon the right foundation. Now a word of warning here is that everything we're going to talk about the next few weeks requires work. No amens on work. <laughs> but you can't have a house without putting in some work. The Bible even says, work out your salvation with fear and trembling because God's at work in you. What Jesus started can only go further if you're willing to work with him. He lays the cornerstone, but he's like, now we're going to work together to build a solid life. Can you say amen? So here we go. I hope you're taking notes because you got to wrestle with some of this stuff. And some of this can be very challenging, but that's what it means to own a home. It's very challenging. The first thing we need to realize is that you cannot build a solid life based on feelings. My friends, my first point to you today is that feelings are not reliable. Think about it. I fell in love with two houses that weren't reliable. I could have, I could have done what a lot of people do. I could have asked for a second opinion because I didn't like the first one. Oh, Y'all ain't going to talk to me today. But here's what the Bible says. There is a path before each person that seems right, but it ends in death. And he's not talking just about physical death. He's saying like it ends in emotional death, relationships death, financial death, like ministry death. Like there are certain things that feels right, but feelings are not reliable. One of my favorite thinkers of our day, and he's a polarized figure. Some people love him, some people hate him, but I love him because I love his heart. I love this quote from him. And he said this, Ben Shapiro said, facts don't care about your feelings. <laughs> oh, that's such a good word. Listen, I could, I could tell my friend, listen, okay, thank you so much, but you know what? We're going to go ahead and take a chance anyways. But guess what? Termites don't care about my feelings. Bad bones don't care about my feelings. Right? So if we're going to build a solid life, we better go beyond what we're feeling and get into the facts of what we're feeling. This is why the Bible says you should walk by faith and not by sight. Sight is what you see. Faith is the expectations of what God can do, what you can't see. So my friends, facts don't care about your feelings. And this is hard because we live in a society of feelers. People just feel their way through life. But the problem is, feelings don't always align with facts. Hey, but I love him. But what are the facts? And sometimes we're so clouded by our feelings that we're not even seeing the reality all around us. It's not until honeymoon is come down that we saw all of it and we go, oh, I guess my one of favorite ones when the girls go, he's ugly anyways. Like, girl, he was always ugly. <laughs> you were just in your feelings. You didn't see the facts. Like, I, I do premarital and I do my best to try to bring the feelings down to see facts, but they're so in la-la land that they can't see anything. I try to tell them, listen, don't invest on your wedding, invest in your marriage. Your wedding is one day. Invest in your marriage going, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. Buy a food at Walmart is better than going in debt starting off because the number one reason people fight in marriages is money. But we're so wrapped up in our feelings, it's not until things come crushing down and we're like, we should have bought the food time. <laughs> Facts don't care about your feelings. 
So my friends, we got to ask the question, how do we make sure we're not making decisions based on our feelings? I think the key is, how do I unclog and unclog my judgment? The best way to do is to do what we did with the house, is to ask for opinions of experts. It's to include other people in my decision making. So I'm not just making a decision based on my feelings. And but here's the thing. We have a tendency to shop around for opinions that will match our feelings. You know, the Bible even has a word for it. The Bible calls it itchy ears. The Bible says it's going to come a time where we're going to want people to tell us what we want to hear. So today, this is very convicting. So you might say, uh, I don't know, I don't like that message. So I need to go home and find me a podcast that will suit me. <laughs> I, I, need, I need someone to tell me how amazing I am. And how I should be in my feelings. I need Drake. In the meantime, there's termites in the house that don't show up tomorrow, but eventually. And then when people try to tell you, you get upset. Why? Because your feelings matter more than facts. So if we really want to build a solid life, my friends, let's get around some people who will tell us what we need to hear, not what we want to hear. Do your homework. I remember when, we, I, when I fell in love and I was asking mentors around me, I never forget what my professor said. He said this. He said, listen, do your homework. Get to really know her. Get beyond your feelings. Ask a lot of questions. Get to know where you're going and where she's going so you know you're going the right, the right place. He said, at the end of the day, you're going to take a step of faith, but it's not blind faith. It's faith with homework. Hey, do your homework. The Bible even says, if you're lacking wisdom, wisdom, ask God for it. God would love to be part of your decision making if you would include him. You may not like what he has to say, though. <laughs> That's what I find. I remember one time, one of my mentors rebuked me about something, and I did what a lot of us do. I gave him the yes and amen, but my heart was not receiving. And I remember going home. Thinking, here's what my thinking thought was. I'm a man of God. <laughs> He's just a pastor. And I remember trying to read my Bible that day. I'll never forget it. This day has been seared in my mind forever. I tried to read my Bible. I got the Proverbs. The Proverbs that I read that day says, he who hates correction is stupid. So at that point, I can rebuke the devil, but you can't rebuke the word of God. And I made a decision that day. I never forget. I got in my room. I got on my knees. I said, God, whatever it takes, rebuke me, correct me, do what you have to do. Just don't let me be a dummy and, and make decisions on my own. <laughs> Ask God for wisdom, my friends, if you want to live a solid life. It will save us a lot of headaches if you would just include wise people, and the Holy Spirit in our decision-making. Can you say amen? The second thing you got you to figure out is, is, is that there's many ways to have a shaky foundation. The second one is this, it's cutting corners. Isn't it amazing sometimes in buying a house, you want to try to get the cheapest stuff and then you pay a price for it? Like the house we have now, what we're realizing now about two and a half years, three years into it, is that a lot of things were done by the homeowners and they were done wrong. Because they were trying to save. But some things are worth the investment so you don't have a headache later. Book of Proverbs. I'm going to share a lot of Proverbs today because it's a book of wisdom. It says this. Look at this. Take a lesson from the ants, you lazy bones. I didn't call you lazy bones. The Bible did. Don't shoot the messenger. Learn from their ways and become wise. Watch this. This is amazing. Though they have no prince or governor or ruler to make them work, they labor, all, they labor hard all summer gathering food for the winter. I love that. The Bible is always like, man, pay attention. Even nature is trying to teach you something. 
What I love about this is that he says, look at those guys. They don't have anyone telling them what to do. You know why? Because I believe this with all my heart. The greatest accountability partner you will ever have is the person you look at in the mirror. Because if you can lie to that person, then you're, you're done already. You can lie to everybody else, but can you lie to that person you'll see in the mirror every day? It goes on to say, look, but you lazy bones, again, I didn't call you lazy bones. Take it up with God. How long will you sleep? When will you wake up? A little extra sleep, a little more slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest, then poverty will pounce on you like a bandit. Scarcity will attack you like an armed robber. Did you catch this? Cutting corners are going to lead to dead end streets. You know, it's funny, in the, in the church, we don't talk enough about the sin of laziness. But laziness might be the number one sin that keeps people from their purpose and their destiny. Laziness is what keeps you from having a prayer life. Laziness is what keeps you from reading your word. Laziness is what keeps you from serving. Laziness is what keeps you from investing. Laziness is what keeps you from going to work late. My friends, sometimes going cheaper has a price. When I was a teacher, my, the kids that always concerned me were the kids who were happy when they got a C. Man, that concerns me. Because so I'm like, if you start settling for C's as 15, you're going to settle for C marriage. You're going to settle for C ministry. You're going to settle for C parenting. You're going to settle. Not realizing that bad habits begin very, very early. Some people are 45 with habits of 15-year-olds because they were big cutting corners. The problem with, with cutting corners, it becomes easier and easier. The problem with quitting, it becomes easy to quit. When you quit the football team at 15, it's easy to quit your marriage at 45. Oh, I'm telling you, this stuff will stay with you if we don't deal with them. Cheap now is consequences later. When we first got married, we bought a lot of IKEA furniture. 15 years later, I don't have any of them. <laughs> My friends, I want to say some things here. You can't cut corners, expect a solid life. When you take shortcuts, you delay your life. I believe there's certain mountains that God will put in front of you, and if you don't go through them, he'll move it and put it somewhere else. Listen, when you cut corners, blessings are put on hold. What should have taken a year might take 10. Don't believe me? Go read the Bible. It should have taken them 11 days to get to the promised land. It took 40 because of, because of, short, because of cutting corners. Some people might are in the brink of, of, a, of a blessing and a breakthrough, and they cut a corner. They didn't realize that you set yourself back. It's like driving through New Bedford. If you miss one one way, <laughs> you know it's going to take you 10 minutes to get. I see God's plan that way. God's like, you should have taken this because I'm the way, the truth, and the life. And when you're not doing that, then I'm going to have to like reprogram the whole thing. I mean, I would have taken you two days, but now I'm going to take you 30 years to get. I'm telling you, my friends, pay attention to cutting corners. I think the worst part of life is, is losing God's favor. Man, your life flows when there's a favor on it. And God's favor is on it, you're grinding. For those of you who know the favor of God, know what I'm talking about. There's nothing like having the favor of God in your life. You will work hard, but he works with you. But when you don't have God's favor, you're working and it turns into grinding. Oh, man, I'm telling you, we're going somewhere here. I pray we're here to be mature people who say, God, I want to go the distance. I don't want to be a one-hit wonder in your house. I don't want to be a spiritual vanilla house, vanilla ice. <laughs> you ever watch the show, Where Are They Now? I see a lot of people who have come to church and you ask, where are they now? One-hit wonders. Anyone could be a one-hit wonder. 
I was watching this great documentary by Dave Foster, a man who was behind so many hits over the years. And he says, anyone could have one hit. Key is, can you keep making it? Can you keep producing? My friends, you can't. When you cut corners, you sacrifice your future. My friend Sean C. is a pastor in Avon, Mass. Put it this way. He said this. He said, you can't get what God has planned if you don't walk the path that God directs. You can't get there because God doesn't cut corners. On Wednesday, we talked about obedience. We talked about a man named Saul who decided, I'm going to please God the way I want to please God. And God says, yeah, but your obedience is more important than your sacrifice. Because my friends, half obedience is no obedience. You can't be half pregnant. You either are or you're not. If you're not sure, facts don't care about your feelings. Take a pregnancy test. My friends, sin has consequences. I believe in the grace of God. I believe he's powerful. I believe he forgives. I believe he restores. But there are consequences. You don't believe me? One of the greatest men in the Bible named David. The Bible gave him the greatest compliment. You won't find a better compliment than what God gave him. He said, this man is after my own heart. But guess what? One day, he cut a corner. And guess what? The favor of God left him and his family. See, we know him for killing Goliath, but the story doesn't end there. He got killed by lust. And his family paid a price afterwards. He died alone, fighting his own kids. Because there's consequences to cutting corners. The termites don't show up tomorrow, but they'll show up in your marriage two years later. They'll show up in your finances three years later. They show up in your kids. Whatever we don't deal with, we'll show up in our kids. So cutting corners, man, is pricey. It's very pricey. So I pray that we want to build a solid life. Can you say amen? Here's another one. Shaky foundations. This might, might, might confuse you, but I think it's, it's so true. A weak inner circle leads to a weak life. I was a youth pastor for many years. Told the kids all the time, show me your friends, I'll show you your future. The Bible says it this way. The Bible says, look, all the joys of those who do not follow the advice of the wicked or stand around with sinners or join in with mockers. A weak inner circle is a weak life. Did you see the progression of this? He says, look, it starts with an advice. Next thing you know, you hang around it. Next thing you know, you join in. My concern is a lot of times people make decisions based on I'm not doing anything wrong or they're not doing anything wrong. I think that's the wrong question. Better question is, what are we doing right? I don't want to live my life on the defensive. I'm not doing anything wrong. I want to live life on the offense. I'm going to do some things right. And I need some people around me who want the same things. My friends, the Bible says bad company corrupts character. We usually, this is so, I pray you get this. We usually raise up to the level of our surroundings. If our friends are going somewhere, more likely we're going to go somewhere. If our friends settle, more likely we're going to settle. We don't realize how much of our lives has to do with our surroundings. Because it's easy to settle when the whole surrounding says settle. It's easy to be mediocre when the whole surrounding says be mediocre. Listen, the right voices will make us excel or settle. Wrong voices will make you settle for mediocrity. Your life is as strong and effective as your inner circle. Weak inner circle leads to weak outcomes. No accountability equals no growth. Every marriage needs healthy sounding board. Last thing a healthy marriage needs is someone who knows nothing about marriage. 
Last thing you need is to ask advice from a person who's never been married about your marriage. And the, I'm, you know how many people have jacked up their marriage because they listen to their girlfriends who've never been married, who is bitter about every man because they generalize everybody's mistake and then they say, yeah, it's the same for you. And they're vomiting over your marriage as opposed to lifting you up. Telling you, man, every business owner needs wise mentors. You don't need the guy who cut corners telling you how to do business. Every young person needs spiritual veterans because the last thing a 15-year-old needs is another advice from a 15-year-old. <gasps> you know what you should do? No, do you? <laughs> That's the last thing you need. This is why I think the church should be a community that builds upon each other. That's why I believe at some point in your life, you got to become a mentor to somebody else. And if you don't want someone to imitate your life, then what the heck are you doing with your life? If I was you, I wouldn't. Well, <laughs> here's some key questions to check your inner circle because I'm telling you, it plays a major role in your life. Does your inner circle make you better? Let's be real. There are some people you talk to, they drain life out of you. Do you ever go and hang out with someone, you went upright and came down like this? What happened? I was hanging out with Sally. <laughs> Girl, not but drama, but I love it. <laughs> you keep going back. I had a friend of mine, every time I saw him, yo, dude, what's good? Yo, I'm hurting, man, just hurting. But then I saw a common denominator. I'm like, every day I see your car in the same house, parked in the same house. You go there every single day. You come back drained, put two and two together. <gasps> Can I, I'm going to say this. I shouldn't have to be loyal to dead things. I think there's a false narrative in loyalty. I'm going to be loyal to you if you're loyal to the things that's going to get us somewhere. But if you're not doing anything with yourself, I'm not going to be loyal to you so we can say, look, we're loyal to mediocrity together. One of the greatest decisions I've ever made in my life, it was the most painful decision, what the greatest decision I made was leave my surroundings. It's what has made me who I am today. God gave me enough sense to say, hey, your days are numbered here. It's not because it's bad, not because it's good, but because it's not great. Sometimes we settle for good when God wants great. Listen, do they motivate you to follow Jesus? Life is too short. I don't want to be around people who tries to damper my walk with the Lord. You get all excited, you go to church, and you, and you fire it up, you go home. Ah, oh, come on, man. You're getting too serious with that whole Jesus thing. You better start checking some people's motives. Because you wouldn't be saying that about, you're getting too serious about this club thing. You're getting too serious about this weed thing. You're getting too serious about this shady stuff. Why don't we talk about those things? I'm telling you, at some point, wisdom has to hit and say, wait a minute. I'm going, I'm getting life, I'm getting blessed, and you're over here throwing water on my fire? Guess what? I don't need that in my inner circle. I don't need people who are going to draw me out. <laughs> so funny how the world preaches every day, and we just eat it up. It's not a day that the world doesn't preach to us. Do you? Be selfish. Go for it. Be shady. Do what you got to do. Well, I got to do Jesus. He's the, the, the cornerstone of my life. He's the foundation of my life. He has never let me down. What have you done for me lately? Listen, when you get around them, if they don't excite you about life, you've got the wrong inner circle. I don't know about you guys, but I'm 42. I don't have time to waste. I think I told the story before, but man, I remember, I'll never forget when I was in college. 
hanging out with my boys and we all saved because sometimes it's in the church. We're all saved. We're like the Christian Hu Tang. There's about 15 of us running deep, following Jesus. But I'll never forget, I'm in this room and I'm watching this movie with them and the Spirit said to me, is this all you want? This is all you're going to get. I've never seen a farmer be surprised by his fruits. But we are so surprised by our fruits. You would never see a farmer go to his land and go, oh, how do we get tomatoes? <laughs> Who did this? <laughs> no, they know I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sow and I'm going to work the land. Eventually, I'm going to reap tomatoes. It's amazing to me in life when people go, how did I get here? Yeah. <laughs> one, led, one thing led to another. Man, a lot of things lead to a lot of things for you to be naked with somebody. Y'all ain't going to talk to me today. Tell you something, man. This is also important. Are you the kind of friend that you want for yourself? Because it can't just be one-way street. Here's how I feel. Life is too short. I don't have time to waste. I tell the staff and I leave us all the time. If you're not bringing something to the table, what the heck are you doing here? That's how I feel. Life is too short for me to be carrying dead weight around me. Last thing I need is to get married and still be a missionary in my own house. Y'all didn't understand that. I need to be a missionary to a dead world. I don't need to be a missionary to people in my own house. (laughs) You, You understand what I'm trying to say? The next thing, my friends, is Solid life requires a teachable spirit. If you have an unteachable spirit, your life is already over. Before you even started, it it, it ended already. The Bible says, don't be impressed with your own wisdom. You ever see people impressed with their own wisdom? Everything you tell them, I know. (laughs) I know. I know. And then you want to ask this question. Well, if you know, how come your life doesn't look like it knows? Nothing worse than Christians who know everything. This is the funniest one for me, is the ones who think because they know, they know some scriptures, they know wisdom. I've heard people tell me, oh, you, you don't really preach the word of God. You preach something that's watered down. It's like, man, listen, I'm trying to preach life. I'm not trying to give you dead religion who just says I know a lot of things. Because I don't know about you, I'm trying to do life here. We're not going to seminary, we're going to life. Because some people go to seminary, it's like going to cemetery. You ever see people who knows everything about the Bible, but you don't believe them? <laughs> and I don't believe you, because I don't see it. Where, like we talk about the joy of the Lord today, it's like, why are you grumpy all the time then if you know the Bible? Because the Lord's going to come judge everybody. (laughs) Wait, you are the Lord. I think it's you. (laughs) Because the Lord is a happy God. Even in his wrath, he shows mercy. You don't. (laughs) Listen, when you stop learning, you stop growing. And guess what? The moment you become a homeowner, you, you, you have to grow. You have to learn. Like, you are forced to know things that under normal circumstances you would never have to know. I am not handy at all. But I've had to YouTube some stuff (laughs) since we bought a house. Like, I don't know anything about construction. But man, I find myself going, so how do I fix this toilet? And I remember not long ago, you can ask my wife this, I, I got to fix the toilet. I was excited. I was running around the house like, I did it. Ah, ah. Because when you own something, you take ownership of it. And it forces you to learn, and that's a good thing. The problem is when I stop learning, I stop living. Followers of Jesus are supposed to be a lifetime learners. 
You know the word disciple means student? They have to keep always learning and growing. Listen, one of the things I love about YouTube, if you go to YouTube with the right heart, you can learn a lot. Like YouTube to me is like a university. Like I can listen to amazing people about different things about life. I try to branch out my understanding. I don't believe in just listening to Christian things. I believe that if you really want to be a raw individual, you got to listen to all kinds of stuff and you got to bring in all kinds of understanding of life so you can be a well-rounded person. I love being able to go on YouTube and listen to people like Ben Shapiro. I don't agree with everything he says, but I'm learning from him. I love learning from atheists. Atheists have stuff to teach us as well. I love learning from anyone who is learning something in life. Because if not, what we do with Christianity is we narrow it down to a little bubble. But God is too big for that. Jesus said, if Jesus is the truth, then whatever you find truth, you claim it. That is so good, see? Because all we do is watch TV and we don't know that God has a whole range of education for us out there, outside of the Christian realm, outside of Christian podcasts. Sometimes you got to put down some of that stuff and pick up some other stuff so you can understand what God is trying to teach you about life. I don't know about you guys, man. I don't have time to waste with you to bring you here on a Sunday morning and just give you a bunch of nonsense and then you go home and you're like, I don't know what he's talking about, but we got up and stood up a lot. <laughs> I'm hoping that we can apply this stuff to our lives. Can you say amen? amen? And the last one today, my friends, if you're going to build a solid life, you can't just wing it. The Bible says, we make our plans, but the Lord determines our steps. There's got to be a plan in place for where you're going with your life. You imagine you call a plumber, he comes over, and you're like, man, so what's the plan? He goes, I don't know. We're about to find out. <laughs> How? I don't know. The spirit will lead. <laughs> oh, man, we... we <laughs> I think the Holy Spirit goes, man, y'all will be doing that to me too much. <laughs> I don't know. I, I know when I read the Bible, it tells me the Spirit leads where there is a strategy, where there's a plan, there's a vision, there's a focus. Without vision, you, you, lack, you lack understanding. Without vision, you perish. And the Bible says, why don't you seek me and I'll give you the wisdom. I'll give you the plan. I'll give you the understanding. I'll give you what you need to do. Oh, you know, amazing to me how many people will go to a building every single Sunday, but they'll just wing it the rest of the week. And then blame God that nothing is working. When God himself had a plan to create the world. God doesn't do anything out of, listen, go read it. He says everything he does is in order and structure and distancy. All of it. It's like, man, I created your body with structure. When your body's out of structure, what do we say? It's, it's dysfunctional. Something is rough. There's got to be a plan for how I'm going to build. He's the cornerstone, but then he's like, hey, here's the blueprint for how you're actually going to build the rest of the life. So there has to be a plan that goes with the spirit. Because without a plan, we're just winging it. Hey, you ask people like, what you doing this week? I don't know. I tell our staff every week, where's your to-do list? If you don't have a to-do list, you don't have a job. It's as simple as that. I think every company organization who takes themselves seriously has a to-do list. I think every marriage that takes itself seriously has a to-do list. If you don't, your wife will have one for you. <laughs> right? So let me end by, by, by simply saying this, my friends. What's the plan? To grow in these areas of life. I, I believe this as, a, as believers. I don't own my life. I manage it. I'm a manager. I'm a steward of these areas that God has trusted me with. Because he's going to come back and ask me, what'd you do? You know what I love about Jesus? The parable of the talents. You know the parable of the talents. He gave some and he gave some and he gave some. But I love about it. He's never told them what to do. Go read it again. He's, he just said, here you go. When I come back, I'm expecting a return on my investment. And the one guy who's like, yo, I didn't want to do anything to jack it up. He's like, yeah, you wicked, lazy servant. 
So what do you do with the life that Jesus has trusted you with? And why should he trust you with more if he can't trust you with little? I always find that funny. I'm like, wait, you want a wife? You can't even run a single life. Why should he trust you with one of his daughters if he can't trust you to be alone? Wait, you want to make more money? You can't tie 20 bucks? You want him to give you more? Wait, you want more ministry opportunities? You don't even read your Bible. You want more? My friends, it's not magic. It's principles. I got five kids. You think I'm going to wing it? It's trusting me with five of them. So I'm always asking him, what's the, what's the best plan? Just to give you an idea of how practical this is. Lately, what I've been doing is, I've been taking them out one by one. Monday's my day off. So I decided each Monday is daddy day. You get one hour, do whatever you want. Daddy will just go along for the ride. You know what's amazing to me? What they want to do means the world to them. The problem is, it's not kids. It's that there's a difference between having kids and being a parent. Took my daughter to Barnes & Noble because that's what she wanted to do. And I, we get home. I'm like, no big deal. We got a book. It's $5. Oh, we get home. She goes, Dad, thank you so much. It means so much to me. Took my other daughter to Target, to the toy aisle. By the way, I'm like, you got to bring your own money. <laughs> I wish I was joking, but I'm not. <laughs> Told the three older ones, y'all got some allowance, bring your own money. I'll carry the other two, they'll pay me later. <laughs> got home from Target, she goes, Dad, that was the best day ever. Why? Because it's an investment. It's an investment. What's the plan? How are you going to grow? How are you going to grow? We have a say around here, just grow by 1%. I look at the church, man, we have a, a lot. You know what I do every week? Hey right, God, what's the area this week? I'm not going to do all of it, but what's one area that we can maybe get a little better? by 1%. I go to a minister school in, in Rhode Island and the kids, they always have the same question. How do you do it, Pastor Marco? Where the sauce come from? Like the sauce comes from work. Just this one message. You know how long it takes to labor over a message? Not just for knowledge sake, but for application sake. You know how many hours of prayer, of, of tears, of wrestling and asking God, let this be real, let this be powerful, let it re resonate with people, let it help people, let it build marriages, let it build finances, let it build homes. I don't know how you feel. This is my life's work. I take it very seriously. And it's not wrong to ask other people, to take it seriously with you when you know you're giving it all you got. So I want my inner circle to be strong. Because I'm giving everything I got to this. It may not even be what you like, but it's all I got. That's why I don't have time to waste with people who are looking for likes and dislikes. That's not how you rate sermons. You rate sermons based on usefulness and effectiveness, not likes and dislikes. That's immature. It's childish. You think people sat around the Sermon on the Mount and go, I didn't like that. Can you imagine going to Martin Luther King Jr., I have a speech and then rate it afterwards? What you think? How do you think Martin did? No, it was about a movement. It's like, what are we going to do about this thing? It's so childish to rate things that we need to be building and being effective about. It. Friends, I believe in this stuff. 
And I would not ask anyone to do what I'm not willing to do myself. That's how I believe that we should live our lives. Follow me as I follow Jesus. That is the ultimate Christian model in every area of life. I will never tell someone to tithe if I haven't been tithing for the last 22 years. I will never tell someone to join a ministry if I haven't done every single ministry that the church has to offer. I will never have someone talk about their parenting if I'm not parenting. I have no right to tell you about my marriage if I'm not working on my marriage. And I have no right to tell you anything personally if I'm not working on it. That's what it takes to build a solid life that is rooted on Jesus as the cornerstone of life. I believe the next few weeks we're going to go on a journey, but it's for people who want to do the work of seeing the will of God. Would you stand with me as we pray and end this morning? It all starts when Jesus is the cornerstone of your life. And you build upon that. If Jesus is not the cornerstone, nothing else makes sense. So it starts there. That's the first prayer we need to pray. Jesus, be the cornerstone of my life. Be the foundation upon which I build my life. Would you join me in prayer? Would you bow your heads and close your eyes? In person, all online, have you made Jesus the cornerstone of your life? This is your moment. And all you have to do is invite him in and trust him as the Savior, as the Lord. We are going to pray this prayer, but especially you who have never trusted in Jesus. Just say, Jesus, today I'm choosing you as my cornerstone, as my Savior, as my Lord as the one that I will build my life upon. Jesus, by your spirit, I want to build a solid life. Help me to not rely on my feelings. Empower me to make choices when it comes to my inner circle. Jesus, I pray today that I will not wing it. But every day I'll, together with your spirit, we will have a plan. Jesus, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Empower me not to cut corners. I want to be faithful. I want you to trust me with more. Have your way in me, Lord, but also have your way through my life. I want to be solid in you. You're where my help comes from. So give me wisdom. Give me wisdom. Let's sing this again as a prayer. Lord, I look to you. You're where my help comes from. Give me wisdom. God, I look to you. I want